full field. And I look forward to, to speaking with you about all of that. Uh, and even, um, you know, even, even, you know, one's work may be finished someday, even that might not be uh, entirely true, uh, because it is kind of like a big commitment um, stepping into to medicine. And it's really something that you have to do a lot of uh, self reflection and thinking about. So that was kind of the intro. And now we can get into to the real meat of today, uh, which is everything and anything to do with your medical school applications. So I've kind of uh, taken the liberty of dividing this up into uh, two different sections. So we have the undergrad pre-med years, uh, which could be one to four plus. So there's a lot of different paths into medicine. Uh, some people get their master's or PhD or even do a different professional school like uh, pharmacy uh, before they enter medical school, but just kind of the, the before medicine, um, looking at GPA and admission statistics, uh, the MCAT, looking at references and starting to think about them before you apply, as well as building your autobiographical sketch. So that's all the activities that uh, go into your medical school application. So things like employment, your volunteerism, extracurriculars, awards, uh, research, and then there's also a sixth section, which is the other. And then once you've kind of done that, you get to a point where you feel potentially that you're ready to actually apply to medical school. And so we can also kind of look at the application year itself. So applying through the Ontario Medical School application service, how to actually craft your autobiographical sketch, because uh, each kind of activity goes in its own separate entry, uh, and there is an art to it. Uh, looking at the actual confidential assessment forms that your referees will end up filling, uh, which are your references. Some schools also require you to write essays, so we can take a look at tips to uh, get the best essays written. And CASPER, so more and more schools are adopting CASPER, which is a situational judgment test, as uh, many of you might know, and most recently this year, um, in addition to McMaster and Ottawa within Ontario, Queens has also added this uh, into their list of requirements. And then if you're fortunate enough to receive interview, an interview or multiple, we can also talk about that. And just one note is that um, if there's anything else you might be interested in kind of beyond this list, I'm really open to those questions as well. You can ask me anything about applying to, getting into med school. And uh, based on my two months here in Toronto, I can give my uh, perspective on the medical school experience. And just a discretion that that everything that I'm saying is is kind of what I've learned and my personal opinion um, and and thoughts going having gone through the process over the past uh, few years. And I'm just kind of one student and just sharing my opinion. And um, it's good to always consult a variety of sources. But um, yeah, looking forward to chatting with everyone. So I see that we have a raised hand already. I'm just gonna try to find how I can access that. Uh, so Zara, I see that you've yeah. raised your hand. I uh, had a question. You may actually address this question later on during your presentation, but when you were applying, um, did you have to look at like different parts of your application and were you considering like the percentages that each school had or were like, for example, um, some resources online say that one medical school is more stat heavy than the other or one medical school may focus more on, um, I think, as you know, McMaster focuses on only on one part of the MCAT. So when you were applying, were you applying to schools where you felt like you were very, like you were well-rounded for, or did you just apply to as many that you were eligible for as possible? Good question. Yeah, so I applied to uh, four Ontario schools, just like kind of trying my, my hand as a third year. Uh, those were the four schools that I was eligible for. So that would be uh, McMaster, University of Toronto, Queens, and Ottawa. And uh, to answer your question, I don't think that I really kind of sat and considered um, specific percentages or anything like that. I just knew that, you know, med school entrance can be uh, so competitive that you just want to try your best to, to maximize your, your stats or your kind of um, your performance across all of these domains. So it just ended up being that, and, and it's a really good thing. And, and it's fortunately that different schools do kind of place more or less emphasis on certain areas. So in, in my opinion, 
if you feel like you might kind of based on looking out of school statistics and kind of um, doing your own research, if you feel that you have a shot at a certain school, um, I would apply there and definitely not like discount it based on you know, certain specific factors. Like if you feel like you're missing a little part of, of I don't know, a certain extracurricular activity um, and then discount it like that. I would try my best to kind of maximize everything and then apply broadly. Like that's the approach that I took. I had actually a follow-up question to that. So in terms of, I mean, a lot of people say having like a backup plan thinking about applying in the states or applying other elsewhere since there's only six Ontario schools is that something you considered from the get-go or what, what was what was your um, mindset yeah so personally uh, in my mind I I had always had a, had a good idea that I wanted to do medicine and kind of thinking about kind of the general roots and you hear all these things like the fact that it can get very competitive in Ontario, so people look elsewhere. Uh, for me, as a, as a third year, I was just kind of trying to, to almost like test out and, and best case scenario, I get in and worst case scenario, I don't get in and then I can go back and, and reevaluate and improve my applications that way. But definitely there are a bunch of different options to explore, like the States is, is an option and I have several friends who went to the States as well. Um, it's just a matter of, of your preference. Like some people may uh, consider staying here in Canada and doing additional school, like a master's or PhD to try to make themselves more competitive just because they have that uh, real preference to stay here in Canada and other people after a three or four year or after it would be four years to go to the United States. So after a four year bachelor degree, um, they just apply very broadly and kind of have this mindset of, I'll kind of go wherever accepts me. And if it's Canada, it's Canada. And if it's the States, it's the States. Um, but for me, I think if I would have had to apply again, then definitely the States is something that I would have considered as a fourth year. Um, I was just wondering, I know a lot of med schools will look at um, if you've done any research projects or like a thesis. I was just wondering if you had any experience with that. Sure. I'm just going to share my research slide. Okay, so in terms of research, there's like a few uh, questions I think you have to ask yourself. I personally did uh, do research. So I started doing research in the summer after my first year of university. And I knew that I wanted to um, come back to Toronto for the summer. And I kind of attended this healthcare conference at Queens, which is the same one that I ended up presenting at the following year. And there I met a lot of student researchers and it kind of inspired me uh, to take an interest, like an early interest in research. Um, so then I think like, despite my involvement in research, it's not necessarily something that you have to have. It's just nice because it kind of exemplifies this um, scholarly side of you, which is again, a, a one of the six sections in the Ontario Med School application, and also a cluster that's specifically evaluated by U of T. Uh, research is by no means the only way to show that you're a scholar, um, but it's kind of like a, a very good way, especially if you're interested in, in scientific research in the first place to get involved. So I personally, seeing those students present and take on all these projects, it's something that in, immediately intrigued me. Um, and so the, the, a few tips that I would have in terms of research is to, to plan out your summers in advance, because especially at the more kind of research hubs, like in Toronto, um, Hamilton, potentially like these areas, a lot of um, students already kind of have jobs or have, have emailed professors to, to collaborate and, and have, kind of, kind of arranged a, an opportunity for themselves very early. So I remember that first year, I started reaching out in uh, November, December, already and and some students apply even earlier than that and then the the research itself 
you want to make sure that you're actually interested in what you do because it can be um, very time consuming and demanding, uh, especially if you have kind of um, a, a major involvement within within a project or your supervisor is kind of depending on you to carry out a project. And if you can try to get your work out there by presenting it at conferences or actually being involved in authorship. Um, these are all things that can certainly enhance your application um, by by giving you that that edge on on scholarly on the scholarly cluster, especially for uh, University of Toronto. But as I was saying, doing things like like anything in education, even if you're involved in like your university's um, kind of research journal or you know even tutoring things like that that just show that you have that kind of educational side to you as well um, can can show the admissions committee that you have filled that cluster. And the good thing about research too is that since it is a big component of a lot of um, doctors jobs, so especially here in Toronto, um, a lot of our kind of professors here at the Faculty of Medicine, they, they do research in addition to, to teaching. So, and in addition to practicing as, um, as a physician. So gives you a good idea of whether that's something that you wanna incorporate into your future career. I see here that uh, Olivia has asked in the chat, do you have any tips on how to do well in interviews? Like what's the best way to answer questions? Like why do you wanna be a doctor or why do you want to go to this particular school? So I will go to interviews. So just to get an idea, I'm not sure if we can run a poll or some sort of thing like that, but do we know kind of what percentage of our attendees are pre-application? versus people who have applied right now? Josh or Natasha? Yeah, I'm not too sure if there's a polling option that we could do, but we could type it in the chat. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, so it does seem like oh, we have a lot of pre-app. So good, that's good that you're thinking ahead already or post and just lurking. Sure, welcome. Um, okay, so let's break down this question. Tips on how to do well in interviews. My number one tip would be to start quite early. Um, it really depends on the school, how much notification you get between having to interview or kind of getting your interview invitation and actually having to interview. Um, as I wrote on the slide here, it could be two weeks, uh, it could be two months uh, or more. But uh, I think the number one thing that you wanna ensure is that you actually get as much practice done as possible. So whether that's practicing, and I talk about it in the next slide as well with friends, family, kind of, you wanna be able to not just uh, have your answers ready in your head, but also be able to kind of speak coherently out loud and evaluate yourself and your own speaking patterns and whether you're being um, kind of clear or you're beating around the bush on some of your answers. The, the number one thing that I would suggest is to really start early and actually take the time to practice and say things out loud. And when you're preparing for interviews, there's a few different things to think about. So as Olivia identified here, why do you wanna be a doctor? Why do you wanna to go to this particular school? These are things that involve your personal motivations for pursuing medicine. And I think that's a big thing that um, you have to kind of reflect about yourself. What are your genuine reasons for wanting to do medicine? Because that's certainly a topic that might come up. And it's stuff that you can't uh, make up on the spot. You have to prepare for, you have to think about, and my, my tip for that is, is just to do a lot of self-reflection and introspection and really think about what are kind of your, the personal circumstances that have brought you to this point that make you believe that you're ready to enter the field of medicine. Um, and, and everyone has their own kind of unique answer to this. And it's that unique narrative that's gonna help you stand out and and impress ultimately the admissions committee and, and secure your acceptance. You might have one motivation, maybe it was some sort of 
um, event in childhood that kind of inspired you. Maybe you took a longer period of time and you kind of realized over time as you matured, as you engage in more and more experiences um, that, that this is the career for you. Uh, but you should be very discreet in your answer and really link it to the, the qualities that, that embody you and, and what you expect to see out of a, a future physician. So in addition to your personal motivations, though, there's a lot of um, other things to think about. In terms of practice, I see Josh just asked as well, what would you recommend for students? So that's on my uh, continued side and I'll get to that as well. But um, a few more things just to think about to round out how you want to structure your preparation. So in addition to your personal motivations, you also want to think, you know, how are you going to answer questions about the Canadian healthcare system and key issues and challenges that are present within the system. Uh, that's something that can definitely come up. And as a future physician, you're expected to kind of be well read and knowledgeable about the things that are going on, um, what's going on in the healthcare scene, how's that going to impact um, you, future physicians, how's that impacting people who are already in the healthcare system. And there's there's a lot of challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, you know, so you want to think about those. And some examples are like the opioid crisis, uh, the recent legalization of marijuana, things like um, medical assistance in dying. These are all, all important issues that might come up. And um, in addition to that, those are kind of more of an information-based uh, thing. So it helps to be well-read and well-versed in those, in those areas, and especially looking at the news in the weeks or months leading up to your interview, um, could help as well. And, and those relevant, relevant news items could, could arise. And you also wanna be able to appropriately handle ethical dilemmas. So that's a little bit different than, than being aware and familiar and being able to give your perspective, let's say on a certain key issue within Canadian healthcare because um, an ethical dilemma can really be anything. And we can talk a little bit about Casper as well and, and how to prepare for that. But um, your CASPER, I almost consider like a preliminary step to the ultimate preparation that goes into ethical scenario questions for the interview. Because CASPER, it's situational judgment. You have to be able to uh, give a stance on an ethical issue and support it. But now at the interview setting, it's not just uh, five minutes for three questions. You have a lot longer to really break down an ethical scenario. And so there's a few resources I can share, um, things like the, the book Doing Right, which we can talk about in Casper as well, that will help you deal with ethical scenarios. And finally, you wanna think about your personal story. So this ties into motivations, but is, is more specific to your actual experience that relates to certain traits that a doctor might have. So, what stories can you share with your interviewer or interviewers that demonstrate your personal suitability for medicine? And, and how can you really create the link for them between you and your experiences and what you've taken away uh, from each experience that you've been a part of and how you're gonna apply it to medicine? So in thinking about all of these things and specifically um, motivations, a good way to structure your preparation is to think about what you've learned. So reflecting on for a given activity, let's say you worked as um, a uh, retail store kind of salesperson, and that was your experience in employment. So from that activity, what were your key takeaways? And we'll talk about that as well uh, within the building the autobiographical sketch. So to continue and to kind of get into uh, Josh, Joshua's question, um, what, how do I practice? What is recommended for students? So as I mentioned, friends and family are great resources. You can record yourself, which really helps to um, kind of, you can look at yourself, rewatch it back as uh, painful as that might seem hearing your own voice and, and seeing your own body language, but really be critical and analyze yourself and, and kind of point out what you would do differently um, and, and how you would change things. And this, um, this tip, although it was given before, I think gains even more relevance uh, this year and, and for future years because um, some of the interviews now, well, some of the interviews last year and all of them probably this year 
um, will, will be virtually. So again, it's not 100% confirmed for this year, um, but recording yourself even with your, your own laptop can, can really help that way as well. And for me, what I also found extremely useful were these student prep groups that met um, like once a week or twice a week uh, in downtown or, or wherever. Uh, it's all students who are in the application process or uh, may have received interview invites or are still waiting and just want to get a head start. And being able to do prep with complete strangers is also very useful because um, you'll find that people give you a lot more kind of honest, uh, critical feedback, and that's really what you need. Um, so if you can trust your friends and family to do that, that's great as well. But I found practicing with students and everyone within this specific uh, group that I was a part of um, was, was just so friendly and encouraging, I found. And we were all kind of supporting each other. And in the end, many, many of us, like a, a very, very um, large percentage of that group that practiced together ended up securing an acceptance. So in the way that you prepare as well, you want to tailor your preparation to the actual interview format. So each school has a little bit of a different format for their interviews. Um, but don't, also, don't be afraid to, to practice using other formats too. So for example, uh, Ottawa's interview structure is a three-person panel, and it's approximately uh, 45 or so minutes. So it's kind of a more of a traditional interview. Uh, whereas an interview at uh, Toronto, you go through four different stations. And an interview at McMaster, you might go through 10 different stations. And, and they're all kind of a little bit different and they each have their own nuances. But for example, even if you don't have an interview, let's say to uh, McMaster yet, and you've, you've just been invited to this traditional panel, using that um, kind of station format and, and timing yourself in kind of as if you were preparing for McMaster also has its benefits because um, that you might find that, that that kind of allows you to hone your skills in a, in a certain question format uh, more so than a different, different type. So for example, let's say you have uh, five minutes to break down or seven or eight, eight minutes to break down an ethical issue. So timing yourself that way and giving a comprehensive answer in eight minutes um, might also help you to kind of perfect your approach so you can be good no matter where you go. Um, so, so definitely don't be afraid to diversify in that way. So that's kind of my uh, spiel on interviews. If anyone has any more questions about interviews, happy to take them as well, um, or we can kind of head to any other um, area that you might all be interested in. Zara, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I did. I just feel like I'm over talking a little. Um, but I actually had two questions. Um, my first question actually does have to do with what someone just commented. And that was like, um, with the whole ethical dilemma piece, that is something more that I personally just through very light research, I found that it's better to like, have additional resources just to see if there's a better approach to dealing with these situations. So were there any additional resources that you found that best prepared you for um, impromptu ethical dilemmas during interviews. Um, and um, my second question, I think I'll just ask it later on um, during another subsection. Sure, sure. So yeah, so I did mention the book Doing Right. It's very popular. I read the, the first chapter of Doing Right before I did my Casper because it breaks down and it's by, um, I believe, um, Philippe Hebert. Um, he, I think it's on its like fourth edition now. What was actually cool is that he was one of our um, small group facilitators. So it just kind of all clicked for us that we're looking at the author of this famous book and he's leading our session. But that book would definitely recommend, even just if you, re if you read the first chapter, uh, it gives you a really good breakdown of how to approach an ethical scenario. And when you go into these things, you really want to have a, a mindset of, of how it's going to Kind of go and what your format of your response will be. Uh, so having that structure and kind of, you know, you can take from that book, you can look at other resources as well, and then kind of make your own personal, um, you know, structure to how you're going to approach. So I found that that really broke it down well. The rest of that book is very much about um, what I was talking about before, like the 
kind of issues that it, it so it takes an ethical lens to a lot of issues within Canadian healthcare and within healthcare in general. So that's kind of another uh, question format there that kind of you know combines the the current Canadian health issues plus ethics. So that's um, a nice read as well, but it's quite dense, and uh, you might not have time to read all of it, but still a, a nice read. Uh, the other thing you can check out is the Washington University. Uh, has a specific page on, on ethics. I don't know if they call it bioethics, but I found it to be a really nice resource as well. What they do is they give you ethical scenarios like in all aspects of healthcare and it lets you read the scenario and then uh, you can kind of pop open a pop-up to get what their answer would be or kind of ways to approach it. So for me, I use those two mainly. And I found that once I read enough scenarios, I could kind of develop the structure of like, first, I'm gonna start with this sort of um, kind of opening sentence that I'm gonna break down the issue into, um, you know, like um, points on both sides like that. Once you have that approach, then you'll find that things go a lot more smoothly and you'll be able to apply it to, to more scenarios. But I'd recommend those two. I see that uh, Abdul, I noticed some books talk about medical ethical issues. So yes, um, I know that like the, the only one that I'm very familiar with is doing right. Um, but there definitely are resources out there. Sure, no problem. There's definitely resources out there. And again, you don't have to have this perfect, perfect understanding uh, when you go in, they're not expecting that, but they're expecting that if you kind of get a, a basic issue or even something a little bit more advanced, you'll be able to contend with it and show that you're um, logical and that you're not just kind of um, giving a, a one-sided approach to it. Um, yeah. I see Manoush asks, what resources uh, would you recommend for studying the different categories on the MCAT? I've seen a lot of classes for med school prep with, for example, the Princeton Review. Have you found that people use these programs? Um, sure, let's take a look at the MCAT. So my slide on the MCAT uh, is quite basic. I just kind of goes over what's like the, the basic kind of information. You need it to apply to four out of the six Ontario schools, but it's used differently. So essentially there's no specific kind of best path to go about it. And you really have to be uh, reflective kind of with yourself and figure out what works best for you. Um, so whether that's taking a course or using a certain like prep company, it's really tough to advise because everyone learns differently and has a different approach to it. Um, some people with the science background might find that, you know, I've heard stories of friends uh, sitting in a course and, and just being like, this is a complete waste of time. I'm spending like eight hours reviewing very basic things that maybe other people who did not have a science background already knew. And, and then they were just felt like they were wasting their time. So maybe that's studying independently. Maybe you do have that science background, but you need that little bit of motivation to, um, to, to push you along and kind of make sure that you're on track to meet all your milestones over the, the summer usually is when people take it. So again, it's, it's, I've heard a lot of different um, stories and success stories too, both with and without um, these specific companies. Uh, generally, generally, people do get like some sort of set of book books or notes that they can refer to um, and then kind of guide themselves with. But I don't personally have any specific recommendations for, for a certain company or a certain resource um, for, for studying the different categories. Like my, my best advice for this is to practice, do a ton of practice. Um, make sure that you kind of work through all of the resources that are provided by the uh, AAMC, so the makers of the MCAT, and then um, consider, because as we talked about, different schools have different requirements. McMaster, for example, heavy emphasis on uh, cars and doesn't look at anything else. Queens looks at 
all four categories as well as your total score. U of T is just a threshold, right? It's so varied by every school that depending on what schools you're interested in or if you're applying broadly all of them, you can set target scores for yourself and, and for each section and for overall, um, just to kind of make sure you're in the range that you want to be in. So I hope that kind of um, speaks to the MCAT a little bit. I'm sorry I don't have any specific uh, recommendations in terms of companies or books, but uh, yeah, sure, no problem. I think Eric had a question. Hi, Eric. Hi, how's it going? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering in terms of the application process, like right at the beginning, um, I know like everyone's application process is like very unique and everything, but in terms of like GPA, extracurriculars and all that stuff, does it like, it, uh, does it vary based on like school? Like if you have like more extracurriculars, they're like a little more lenient on the GPA or if you have a higher GPA, they're a little bit more lenient on like how many extracurriculars you have or references, you can just like. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so I think that um, like I just I'm just going to put up like a stat slide um, because every school is, is so different in terms of in terms of what they're specifically looking at. And it's also it, it's also um, worthwhile to mention that, like, you know, even still we like I still don't know exactly like what it is, what's that magic uh, combination. But um, based on the based on what's written kind of on each school's website, um, and going off the, the previously published statistics for that school, uh, maybe you can kind of start to get an idea of what they're looking for or what the at least what kind of the range you need to be in is. And that's all based on how they assess applications. So uh, for example, like taking McMaster as an example, so their stats are on the bottom right. Um, they right because they only look at the car section of the MCAT plus GPA plus Casper then then really it's like um i don't know you might not even have to <laughs> fill out an abs and they'll still take you if those um, three numbers are, are high enough plus your interview um but obviously at the interview itself you you have to have those extracurriculars and those experiences to adequately like to answer their questions and to show that you're fit for medicine so ideally think of it as as you're just developing yourself to to be ready to enter the career of medicine. So ideally you want to have a, a balance of, of strong statistics, so strong GPA and MCAT, um, plus you want to show that you have the maturity and the development and kind of the well-roundedness as an as a individual uh, to actually be ready for the career. So, and then hopefully you can, can be successful in, in your applications. So just even looking at the uh, statistics, um, so let's say for Toronto, looking at, um, at my class, the average accepted GPA was 3.95 here. Um, so, you know, kind of, and this is a weighted GPA, by the way. So if you're uh, in fourth year, if you're applying out of fourth year, then they will remove some courses from that um, to, to make it a weighted GPA. Um, but you can kind of start to assess, like, are you in or around that range, like what's competitive or not? Or for example, Western's um, average GPA of 3.89 and same thing with McMaster. Um, these are just kind of like the, the numbers and, and you can kind of look at them and, and interpret them um, based on your kind of where, where you stand in relation to that. And then clearly the schools that require you to, let's say, for, for example, uh, Toronto, Western, they both require essays that focus on your extracurricular activities. Um, so again, it's, it's, you know, I, it's uh, so hard to say how much each thing counts for or, or anything like that, but uh, clearly it's, it's a focus. And, and because the applications do get quite competitive, then, um, you know, having that extra or having that extra involvement or thing to kind of um, push you over the top and make you stand out over other applicants is, is what's going to give you that uh, competitive edge to hopefully uh, make it to interviews and then and then get your acceptance. So my answer is it really depends and varies. And I think as you're building your profile, you just want to be as as diverse as possible in your experiences. And and of course, easier said than done. Um, but yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. For sure.
Olivia asks, how big of a jump is med school from undergrad? So that's also a great question, I think. Um, so it, it honestly depends on what, uh, what you mean by jump, like if we're talking about material difficulty or like the quantity, because I've, it's, I think um, in, in medical school, it's, it's a lot of quantity that you're at this point, you know, two months in, there's just a lot of information that's thrown at you. And it's so awesome if you really enjoy it and, and kind of love the learning aspect of it, because I find that um, the volume does uh, get to be um, quite a lot more than undergrad. But in terms of the actual difficulty of the material, um, it's, it's a lot more kind of like you're taking a clinical kind of approach and clinical lens to things. So it's, it's kind of really enjoyable in terms of like learning the, the, the approaches to, let's say, a certain disease or something like that in a more, in a more clinical way. Uh, and then there's all these different um, like course components and things that you're involved in, depending on the school that you go to. Um, like case-based learning and, and clinical skills. And so I would say that um, it's, it's like, um, you know, comparable in some aspects and different in some aspects as well. Um, but I think that uh, right now I can say that definitely I enjoy the, the learning process itself more. And I also find that um, at least I can speak from my personal experience at Toronto, um, I'm a little bit less stressed than I was in undergrad because a lot of the focus is kind of um, more so like now that you're here and you're in, you're kind of focusing on more so learning for the sake of learning, learning for your future patients and just being kind of the best, um, learning for being the best doctor that you can be. So it's less stress around, you know, getting that 90 uh, to get the 4.0 sort of thing and more on on kind of working with collaboratively with your colleagues uh, and really making the most out of the experience and then adding back a little bit more uh, true balance into, into your experience. So that's, those are kind of the main differences that I've noticed. So I can go back to the um, kind of our initial list of things, just in case um, someone might be thinking about a certain area. Uh, Abdul? Uh, I have a question regarding competition. So do you feel like competing to getting into a certain field in medicine is harder or competing to get into med school is harder? Yeah, so I think, um, at this point, I'm really not sure because it seems like um, if you're talking about like the residency process and then getting into a certain field, that's uh, for for our class right now, it's so far away. So everyone's just trying to kind of explore their interests, figure out uh, what it is they want to be doing. And so um, I'm really not sure how um, competitive that process gets. Um, there's a lot of different interest groups and kind of things you can join to explore your interests um, and kind of develop yourself and see. But I, from what I know, the main thing kind of is, is starting in third or fourth year when you start to do your electives um, and, and as well when you enter clerkship and do your um, rotations, then you get a, a very good idea of what specific field you might wanna go into and there you kind of have to show that uh, you're very interested and motivated and that you know a lot and, and that you can perform well. Uh, and then the competition to get into um, medical school, as I'm sure um, you're all aware, kind of from being in the, the pre-medical uh, process uh, can be uh, quite heavy. Um, so you saw the statistics as well. Um, it, it's not, um, it's no joke <laughs> to, to secure an acceptance and it takes like a lot of, a lot of commitment and dedication. Um, but I um, really like my mindset going into it uh, was not at all. Like I didn't expect necessarily um, the result that I like, you know, would get in after third year. And I was committed and prepared to, to apply twice or three times or four times. I just knew that I wanted to, to pursue medicine and, and that that was the ultimate goal and just kept working towards that. So also in general, like don't worry kind of too much. I know it's really easy to, to look around and see what other people are doing or you know 
you know, this person has this accomplishment and then whatever, but, you know, focus on yourself and your own journey um, is, is my advice. Thanks. Sure. So Krishan asks, how do you deal with stress? So I think for me personally, it's like a mix of, of just adding balance into my life and doing things that I enjoy, like maintaining a social life, friends, spending time with family, doing things that I'm interested in and, and not neglecting like my own hobbies and interests. Uh, while at the same time, you know, remaining committed and motivated to whatever it is that I'm doing. Uh, so everyone's approach to stress is different. There's so many different kind of to, ways to, to go about it. And, and I think every individual um, maybe over time can, can kind of come to realize what works best for them. So, so many different approaches like, you know, reading, spending time in nature, hiking, yoga, like whatever it is that you need to do to, to maintain your own mental health and wellness, it has to be prioritized because, you know, if you keep yourself, um, like, you know, mentally well, then you're able to, to live like a, a proper lifestyle that's going to actually help you perform better on exams and then make you kind of, you know, more, more motivated and then feeling healthier and better. Um, so everyone's going to experience some degree of stress. Uh, it's, it's only natural and especially in the pre-medical years, uh, that is, that is um, very true. Um, but, you know, we all have to try to manage it as best as we can. So uh, Madi asks, how do you approach writing the essays? So great question. And I do have some slides on that. So essays. So first of all, I'll just kind of go over um, which schools take or look at essays, require you to write essays. So that is the University of Toronto. So for U of T, there are uh, seven essays to write. So there's four brief personal essays and this is taken straight from the uh, U of T website. Each essay answers a specific question related to the faculty's uh, mission and values. And then there's three ABS essays, which are the autobiographical sketch essays, uh, which I was referencing earlier, um, which you're required to outline how three activities or achievements from your sketch um, best exemplify the attributes that they're looking for. And this is going also back to U of T's for clusters, which uh, I can share with you all as well, and which are on the U of T website. So Western has uh, up to eight essays. So you don't have to write all eight, but um, from, what, from what I've heard, it's, it's recommended to kind of write as many as you can. They have this abbreviated autobiographical sketch with essays that also relate to um, the, the mission and values of that faculty. And then uh, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine also has, I believe it's four essays and that they're also pretty similar to the, the BPE style of U of T where they ask you a specific question. So now on to some tips. So my first tip is uh, to use clear and concise language in your essays. Pretty much this means answer the question very clearly and in a way that is um, kind of, you know, very, yeah, you, you just have to be clear. When I was editing um, kind of like essays in, in the past or even looking over, you know, things that people write in general, um, there has to be a real emphasis because you have only so many words to, to get all your ideas down. You want to be as concise as possible. And that means really looking at your essays uh, with a close eye, refining them and, and taking out anything that might be um, considered redundant, uh, really getting to the point and, and being clear in your phrasing. Um, that might involve like a mix of long and short sentences, um, you know, you want it to, to flow well, but as I mentioned here in tip number three, it's really your content that matters uh, more so than your style. Um, so, you know, you don't have to, to write a poem. Um, <laughs> you don't have to kind of uh, write a, some sort of like expository essay sort of thing, anything like that. It's, it's really the actual substance of your essay that's going to matter in the end, because um, a lot of these when they're scored, um, 
you know, I, I don't think, you know, from my experience that it's kind of your writing style and then kind of how beautiful your, your sentences are. It's actually what you say, because uh, I'm just kind of imagining, uh, you know, evaluators having a certain rubric and, and kind of um, looking at, at what your essay says and how it relates to the, let's say, mission and values of the faculty. And it's not uh, the way you say something, but it's what you actually say. And that extends to using personal examples or even references um, in your essay to substantiate your points, right? It's one thing to make a general statement. Uh, it's another thing to actually support it with an example from your life that shows why you're fit to practice medicine. Or even a reference, for example, if the essay is about um, a current topic in healthcare, uh, you might benefit from, from, again, doing a bit of reading and, and getting kind of some more insight into the issue that way. And you might want to bring up something um, that, that comes up like that. Uh, another thing is feedback. So whether that's trusted friends or, or colleagues, uh, mentors, whoever it might be, um, having your essay kind of reviewed by, by a few pairs of eyes that aren't your own will give you a lot of uh, perspective as well. Um, you know, good feedback is, is really, really useful. And you can't be uh, too afraid to kind of um, make, make like make substantive changes based on what people say. But ultimately, remember, like you're the person that's writing the essays. So you have the kind of um, like authority, ultimately, based on all the feedback that you receive to make the final call about what you believe is is best to include. And then, as I alluded to in, in the clear, concise language point, you want really an unambiguous answer to the question and, and to make sure that you answer all the questions if there's multiple um, if there's multiple questions posed in a given prompt. It's easier said than done because you know it's it's very easy to start writing and then kind of realize that you've already reached the word limit and and kind of um, that you have to kind of go over and keep editing it down and down and down. But um, I think with these general tips, you're in a good position to kind of start writing and, and looking at it that way. And that's true for whether an essay is about a topic that's given to you or whether you're writing about yourself. Um, these, this would kind of inform my general approach to an essay. Uh, Natasha asks, I'm planning on taking a gap year in order to travel and work abroad. Do you think that would negatively affect my chances of being accepted? Uh, so, like, again, everyone, it's, it's different for everyone. And I don't think necessarily that, like, a gap year would even have any impact. It's like, you know, they're, they're not evaluating, you know, it's, it's like, it really, it's not based on, like, you know, how many years or whatever, like, anything like that. It's, it's what they say kind of on their site most directly. There's not, there's not like too much reading into it of like what they will think if I take a gap year or do this and this, as long as you're following these specific requirements um, like on their site and they'll, they'll calculate your, your marks in the way that they say and evaluate your um, portfolio or your, uh, your kind of extracurricular involvement plus statistics in the same way as everyone else. So no, I don't think that that would have um, an, any specific negative effect. Uh, Zara, I see that you've answered. I raised your hand as well. Yeah, I actually had um, two quick questions. Uh, so my first question was, um, as an undergraduate student, do you have any advice for getting references? I don't know if you have a slide on this, but um, I've really been involved in a bunch of initiatives on campus and I'm really passionate about them. But unfortunately, when I've um, done a bit of my research, they typically recommend, um, certain schools recommend that you have um, academic references. So I do have one reference because of my research involvement. However, I am missing a couple of potential references. And I was wondering, like, as a young undergraduate student, do you have any advice on really connecting with professionals and working with them, even though, um, even though you may not have the experience as of yet to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that's a good point too. That that it is kind of actually a lot of people have more trouble with their academic uh, reference rather than than the other ones. 
but I think it, it really comes down to the types of things you're involved in, but also a little bit, it can be a little bit of luck too. And just, you know, expanding your network and, and working to meet people who would ultimately um, write something in support of your application. So we need like, you need three. Uh, one can be of your choosing. So that's left very open for you. Uh, that can be more of like a, a character reference even. And, and then as you mentioned, one academic, which people usually get um, like I did as well from a research supervisor, or now they've also put employment related. And then one non-academic can, can almost be equated to, to one of your uh, choosing, just that it can't be <laughs> academic. So they leave it like, they leave it fairly open, just that you need at least the one academic. Um, it, it's just, it's honestly like a matter of, of getting involved, really getting your name out there, um, networking, meeting people and forming strong connections with people that'll be able to, to support your application. Um, I know that a lot of student groups, that's true, a lot of student groups since they're only student run within the university, uh, it can be a little bit challenging, um, but, but um, you have that time kind of over the years that you're building your application to, to meet people and um, hopefully gather your three in that way. Um, sorry, it's not too specific, but it's just, it's just such a broad like question. Really, everyone is different. Um, that, that it's hard to kind of give specific advice there, which I hope you can appreciate. Thank you, that was really useful, thank you. For sure. Uh, I see that Joshua's followed up. For academic, would it have to be someone who taught you in class or as you said, solely a PI? So it can definitely be a professor, for example, that's, that's very valid. Um, the only thing that I would say there, and that kind of goes into my tips for who your referees should be is that they need to know you pretty well. Like they're answering some pretty, um, what's the word, like deep or, or kind of important questions about you. And they make up a pretty substantial, you know, portion of your application. So they're answering, would this applicant make a good physician? They're asked to comment on and rate you on each of these four areas. So like things like your empathy, or your um, problem solving skills, even looking at an area of improvement for you as well. So, and any other info that a uh, med school admissions committee might want to know. So they do need to know you quite well. And if you're in an undergrad class of, of 300 people, for example, then it's tough to, to form that relationship and, and get to a point where they know you very in depth to, to write you an outstanding reference. Um, so, that's why a lot of people do end up choosing their their PIs because with the PI you're more so working in like a, in a smaller team or even one on one so they can really kind of get that in depth understanding of you as a person so um, it doesn't have to be a PI and there's also certainly ways to to connect with professors kind of more on a, a more on individual level so that they might ultimately be able to end up writing your reference so. Maybe you're interested in a certain prof's uh, line of work, and then you go and and join their lab. Then over the years, you can build that relationship. So it's not specific, but you should also consider who you're asking and under what circumstances uh, very carefully. Uh, Abdul, you also had a question. Yes, I had a question regarding the, uh, the essays to write. I have always found it difficult to write essays or like writing in general, maybe because English is my second language. Do you recommend any courses, any resources to improve on writing? Like always writing courses are what bring me down, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, There, it's true because um, at least at the university level, like, um, you know, with, with us and, and especially like pre-medical students, the, the precision of uh, science allows us to do quite well. And then when it gets into the arts, uh, you kind of never know. And, and it's a lot, the, the grade distributions might be a bit different. So I don't know, like it all depends on your comfort level, um, like the courses that you want to pursue. And, and the advice for that is just to 
um, to, to, to always be enrolled in the courses that you're interested in and that you're confident will give you the best chance of, of success, which success is getting um, a, a high grade. Uh, in terms of developing your writing skills and, and that sort of thing, um, again, it's, it's difficult to say like, if, if it's a matter of like taking some sort of online course or, or doing your kind of personal skills development and kind of doing more reading because I, you know, just in terms of general advice, like the more you read, um, you do ultimately become a better writer and you kind of familiarize yourself with, you know, more words, more sentence structures, like that sort of thing. And then when you're actually in the process of, of writing, really get that critical feedback from as many people as possible. Because I know like you probably will have those uh, amazing ideas. It's just a matter of getting them on the paper in a way that's like, you know, very clear and coherent. So use your school, like your university as well. They probably have a like, I'm, or actually I'm not sure if like York might have a writing center or, or that sort of thing or like even a peer editing services uh, that you can go to to kind of brainstorm plus um, improve your writing skills. So I hope that helps. Um, yeah. yeah it did. They do actually have. Uh, also, uh, when writing, uh, I usually tend to like go over the word limit, then start to trim down. When trimming down, do you suggest to uh, omit certain unnecessarily topics or uh, decrease the level or like make everything more general? Okay, also a great question. I would say the first one. So make everything pretty specific. Like I'd recommend using specific examples and really uh, showing the, the link between the activities that you're doing or your points and kind of really being specific and and not too general, uh, because that's what's going to help you stand out is your personal specific experiences. In terms of omitting certain details that are irrelevant, for example, um, I think one of the essay topics this year might be on like an experience that you had. I think this is specific to U of T, like a, you pursuing something along the lines of like an academic experience that you may not have undertaken otherwise or something along those lines. So instead of using um, like two thirds of the essay to just describe the experience, which, you know, people might do or even half the essay describing, you might be able to describe your specific experience in like two or three sentences and then really focus your essay on what you've learned, what you've taken away, how that's developed you as a person. So I think a common kind of thing is to include all these extraneous details that really don't give any insight to the admissions committee about uh, like who you are as a person. So it's great that uh, someone can kind of paint a picture of their personal experience and include all these details, but uh, you know, you can kind of reevaluate, read carefully and say with each and every sentence in the essay at the end of the day, does it need to be there? Um, would it make a difference if it's not there? And that's kind of the way that I would work at it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, perfect. I see Zara said that the Writing Center uh, at uh, York has free workshops and they're not for credit. They may be useful. So um, there's a tip from your uh, peer there. Uh, Zara, do you have another question as well? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I forgot um, to lower my hand, but I, I did have a quick question. Um, I uh, just wanted to ask, um, let's say an applicant were to apply and then get rejected. Um, I, I was wondering, do you happen to know like what's the best way to handle rejection since a large component of applicants do get um, rejected. Um, I have done a little bit of research and I've seen that the Canadian medical application process seems to not have as much feedback as let's say the US medical experience process, I mean, process. So do you have any recommendations for, um, I guess, going like, let's say getting that rejection letter and just having to, I guess, adjust for the next year? 
Mm. Yeah, it can definitely be disheartening to to get that like rejection. And that's what you said is completely true. Um, a lot of the schools will in the rejection letter, like again, keep it very brief and just say that um, due to the uh, extraordinary number of applicants, uh, it's impossible to provide um, specific feedback in terms of your application. So I think the first thing is you have to be kind of like, first of all, it's a matter of processing it. So every person's different, um, you know, processing like a rejection can be, can be difficult and, um, you know, just doing all the things to, to maintain your own like mental health and well-being, I think that comes first. And then once you're in a state where you're kind of ready to, to do some more reflection and introspection, you can start um, like evaluating yourself and really being honest with yourself about what was good about your application and maybe what could have been better. Um, and then ultimately, you know, as a pre-medical student who is very committed, let's say, to this career path, then, you know, you kind of have um, only like forward to look. And so once you do that evaluation and realize where you can improve, whether it's your, your GPA, your MCAT, extracurriculars, then, you know, you have to kind of take that into your, your hands or the essays or whatever it might be, take that into your hands and kind of put your best foot forward and keep working at it. And like, you know, the average number of, of, application rounds that kind of a uh, typical uh, Canadian pre-medical student will go through can be like up to three times. So it's definitely not easy getting a rejection. And like, I know it can feel um, kind of disheartening, um, but it's, it's a little bit of luck. It's a, a lot of uh, dedication to it and, 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 and just a matter of, of keep like working and then going at it um, and, and do what you need to, to take care of yourself and like maintain your own well-being because it can be quite a strenuous process, but yeah. So I see that um, Manoush also has a question. Um, and then we also want to wrap this up shortly. So I think um, I'll answer this question. So I know it's very dependent on personal experiences, but for yourself, what helped you decide that medicine was for you? So I think it was a mix of different things. And as you said, it is very individual and dependent on you. So I think that everyone kind of needs to craft their own unique narrative to show why they realize like medicine was for them. And you'll find that it's actually very rewarding to um, like look back and, and think about, about what were the personal kind of circumstances that led you to, to kind of like getting to this point in your life where you're saying, yes, I'm ready uh, to become a doctor. And I think for me, that was a mix of like everything that I did. So, you know, a mix of academics and the fact that I really enjoy learning and um, I really enjoy learning and um, kind of that, that whole process, looking at how diverse the, the medical field is. Uh, I'm someone who really uh, loves getting involved in my community and kind of making a, a tangible impact on people. And, you know, I was involved in um, a lot of things during undergrad, really immersed myself in my community and, and really saw how I was able to make a difference on people. So a mix of, of the personal aspect of it, plus the academics uh, was what drove me to decide on medicine. So I think that just about wraps us up. I'm not sure if um, we're concluding this now or I'm taking more questions, but I think and just message uh, Natasha or if Natasha and Joshua can weigh in as well. Yeah, I think we're going to try to wrap this up right now, but thank you for um, answering everybody's questions and thank you to everybody who came out tonight. For sure. Yeah, once again, thank you so much for your time. I know it must be so busy right now, but I, I personally have learned a lot and I hope each of the students have as well.
Thanks so much. And I just see that someone here uh, wrote um, kind of about if they had more questions. I'm just going to put up my um, like LinkedIn from the beginning. So I do invite everyone who's here. And if you have a specific question, um, then please like connect with me. I'm happy to, to answer anything that that um, like it might be uh, kind of popping up in your mind. I know uh, we had to kind of uh, cut this, but I'm really happy to connect with you all and and take questions that way. So just want to, I guess, end off like that. And again, thank you uh, to Natasha, especially for for helping up, helping set up all the logistics of this and then Josh as well and everyone at uh, MedLife. And just want to wish everyone that kind of all the best, uh, good luck throughout this year. And, and best of luck as you ultimately get to the uh, admissions process. Thanks again, Ben. Have a good night. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone.